Well, I've always been fascinated by countries that are isolated. And Burma is the second most isolated country on the planet. I've been all over Southeast Asia. I could see Burma even from Thai outposts. I'm a child of the Second World War, and I knew about, you know, the flying tigers and the airlift to Burma and the road to Mandalay, Rangoon, Mandalay, Burma. I mean, these are names that just evoke memories from childhood. It's exotic. I've traveled all over the world, and corporate influences are everywhere. And in Burma, they hadn't quite entered yet. The isolation lets you see a culture that's somewhat intact. The people are very soft-spoken. They're devout Buddhists. Of course, that has something to do with it. They believe that any suffering they're experiencing today has to be a result of something they did wrong in the previous life. So the country is quiet. You come from Thailand, and then you land in this very quiet country, and you're in another world. This is like no other country I have ever been in. Burma is different. I'm Robert Lieberman. I teach physics at Cornell. I used to teach math. I'm a novelist. I've been a novelist for f over 50 years. Um, I make movies. I was invited by the U.S. Embassy and State Department to go to Burma, and it was a unique opportunity. My job was to work with young film directors for half the time, and the other half was to work with an NGO, a non-governmental organization. We were supposed to create commercials for TB prevention. Right. Things began to snowball, and before I knew it, uh, I'm off and running. This was the chance. This country is unique. The entire globe, there's no country like Burma. Since this is a tropical country, the temperature that's ranging from 80 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit almost every day. So explain to me what they're wearing. We call the Naka. Na it's Naka. The Naka. It's, it's a nakar. kind of plant. The Naka is a paste that is created out of rubbing wood barks, and it keeps the skin incredibly cool. So that helps the people cope with the temperature. The Burmese developed the tradition of drawing Thanaka not just as big blotches and applying them simply on the cheeks, but they start drawing patterns, paddles of roses or different lines that might look like tribal patterns. And, and that becomes in itself a statement of cosmetic beauty, a statement of culture. Marapuka, is that here? There are so many people living in Burma, so many kinds of 
national ethnic groups. This small country is such a diverse country. So he's a Pao? Pao. Pao. And who else? This is? Shan. 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 This is? Pao. Pao. Palang. Palang. And this? Pao. You're Pao. And you? Ima. <laughs> In Burma, there's a complexity of many cultures, as well as language diversity that is astonishing. <laughs> we do have a record of about 132 languages spoken in the country alone. You speak Burmese? Physically, a person doesn't understand another person. They speak a totally different language. Burmese culture has been influenced by many different streams. And for me, that makes us unique. But that also means great difficulties, because there are many ethnic nationalities within, within our country. And we all have to learn to live together. Around the edges of Burma, there are many, many hill tribe people. These are people who live entirely a rural life in the mountains. It's a life that really hasn't changed much for hundreds and hundreds of years. And these hill tribes come from various sources. Some emigrated from north, some came from the south. So there's quite a mixture of peoples and languages. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, the British arrived in Burma and three successive wars took place. At the end of those three Anglo-Burmese wars, Burma became part of the British Empire. The country had been decapitated by the British in 1886 when they took the king and queen off to India and never to return. And that decapitation had a profound impact on the future of the country. I think it had the effect of, uh, of most colonial governments. In many ways, it changed Burma because new values were brought in, new ways of living, and uh, new language, which makes a difference to the way in which you think to a certain extent. Um, at the same time, of course, it was a blow to our national pride, as I think it would be to any, any people's uh, national pride uh, to think that they had been conquered by another people, another nation. Everybody wants to be independent. Burma was called Burma because of the British. When they came in, they just called Burma. But Burma in Burmese is known as Myanmar Nainggan. After the 88 uprising, the new government all of a sudden changed the name of the country from Burma to Myanmar, the capital from Rangoon to Yangon, changed the names of various towns, cities, rivers, mountains. The bottom line is the regime was trying to force people to recognize things their way. If you ask people where Burma is, they can tell you that this is the country that is associated with Aung San Suu Kyi and George Orwell and colonial British Empire, but very few people know where Burma is exactly located. Burma actually is located between India and China and Thailand. On the other side, the country is buffered by the Andaman Sea. This is a landscape that if you were able to see from the air, most likely you would see glittering temples and pagodas. It could sometimes give you the false illusion that this is the country that is glorious and that this is a peaceful country. But there is, of course, when you finally get to the ground level, you will realize that there is something brewing underneath that calm, serene facade of the country itself. I took off from Thailand and landed in Rangoon and 
it was a, a bit of a surprise. Burma, at one point, was described as the rice bowl of Asia. When we were young, we were always proud of the Minglado Airport as the most advanced in Asia. But now it's all like gone. Burma became like the poorest country here. It was the best um trading port, you know, like Yangon was the best trading port in 1950s in Asia, but then it go down, the fate of the country is going down. Going to Burma is like going back in time. Yangon has a lot of old buildings uh, that are slowly crumbling away in the hot, humid weather. Many places look like they haven't been maintained since the British left. I found the downtown shocking. The lights weren't working, there was no power on, uh, there were huge gaping holes in the sidewalk. This is the hole I fell into. This is typical, look at this. You walk along, nice like this, and then you fall. In urban area, uh, we are facing with uh, power shortage. Very regular power cut, but in accordance with unwritten schedule. So we try to remember what time power will come. Just to cook, I try to uh, note down you know, when power will be coming. Uh, yesterday, what time power came. No matter how I try, I cannot get the regular power supply. Uh, I it's mean, unpredictable. The schedule, very it's unpredictable. unpredictable. So I think it's uh, symbolized uh, the life here. You know, everything is unpredictable. Well, they went to electricity. Electricity's back on again. Burma today just seems like a very surreal and slow-moving environment. The juxtaposition of the super wealthy and the completely impoverished is it's just stark and it's everywhere. You'll see multi-million dollar homes and right across the street from these homes will be shanty towns, dilapidated homes with people bathing on the front porch out of buckets of dirty, grimy water. And these are, these are common things. There's no buffer zone between the super wealthy and the super poor. Everyday life of uh, average people here, it's difficult because the first thing is money. Income here is very low. Many people here depend on daily wages. And this daily wage under his life is very uncertain. So what do they do as soon as they get up? They pawn mosquito nets, blankets, pillows. They pawn it for a small amount of money. Get the money, use it as a bus fare to get to work. They'll come back in the evening, 
then after cooking and eating and washing the pots and plates they go and pawn it again just to retake back the mosquito nets and the pillows it's heartbreaking sometimes to see such poverty but again people here in Burma will be very quiet and peaceful as long as their bellies are full if they have a meal a day it's quite decent enough if they have two meals a day it's better if they can have three meals a day they can be said to be well off so it's really heartbreaking to see so many people especially in the satellite town areas I mean, they are, obviously they're poor, but they are proud, they're hardworking, they're not ashamed of being poor. They may be dressed in rags, but they hold themselves like princes. They behave with dignity and pride, and there is so much uh, humor within them. Well, this country's been isolated from the outside world f since the 60s. And as a result, it makes it a very interesting place. It's been a military regime in power since 1962, and they simply don't want outside influences. So do you think they're watching me because I'm filming? Yeah. They know you are using a video camera so that they are checking on you. Can I, am I allowed to film in, in Yangon? Uh. <laughs> am I? You are not. I think you do have to be careful about filming in Burma. People have been arrested and thrown into prison for doing much less than filming. Is it getting nervous? Yeah. No, no. The few times that I, I was filming, you know, a public building, I was hassled. Once I was hassled filming some vegetables in a small marketplace. Oh, okay. So much. A tour, a tourist. The, the officials are terrified because they'll get into trouble if it turns out that they let me film or they didn't react to my filming. Is this the library? Yes. Oh, can I go in? No, no, no. No? You have permission no. from our government. Oh, you have to have permission? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh. You cannot shoot without permission. What happens if they find out? Yeah, they will took your camera away. Yeah. And they will uh, asking you a question. Yes. Uh, why you are shooting this? You, you are name card. Uh, I don't have a name card. I only have. Uh, please, please, oh. you, you write. Uh, and then they will be investigating what you have been shooting. You take your photo? No, I didn't take photos. You no, take no. the photo? I, I... No, no, I didn't take photo. No, it wasn't turned on. No, no, please show, please show. What, what can I show? It That's dead. Look, and then what happens to me? Yeah, uh, you will be following. That will be followed. Yeah. I've heard of Westerners and tourists who have been imprisoned, and I, some of them, I have never heard about them afterwards. So I think, I think you have to take a lot of cautions when you are filming, and I would think that there is a lot of risk involved in what you are doing. There's a real element of fear from the top down. That's why I've tried not to use any names in the film and avoid identifying people. Sorry, sir. So please. Oh, okay. Sorry. Why don't you want your face on camera? Most of uh, the people here were born with intimidating uh, situation. They see, you know, some people were arrested and stay in the prisons, and some people were beaten up. So anything can happen at any time. That kind of uh, yeah. uncertainty always. Um, intimidate everybody's life here. I was questioned by military intelligence, you know, officers. They tied me up, they hang me upside down on the tree. My nose stopped bleeding. Maybe an hour or more later, my eyes and ears stopped bleeding. I was chained for about eight months and basically on your feet and on your waist. They put chains so you can't really move. They put a bag on your head so you can't really see, you barely can breathe. They put two little mice in there. You have to struggle with them. They try to chew your ears or nose, whatever they can bite, you bite them back. That's how you survive. Do you think that filming here is risky? 
tremendously. I think filming here is tremendously risky um, because you just never know who's watching. They, they were asking about me from the ministry? Yes, yes. What did they ask? Uh, they knew that you are the teacher. <laughs> you are the teacher coming to here. Somebody is always watching. Somebody's always listening. Somebody is always reporting back. And you don't know who that person is. So what did they ask? What type of person you are? I, I guarantee that oh, I, I eat together with you and you are a very good person. You, you did not talk many much about Myanmar politics. You, we are talking only about the movies. The government is imposing self-isolation for the decades and decades, even the half century. They don't engage. They don't engage with their people. They don't give speeches. This is not your typical military dictatorship. There's no cult of the personality here. Uh, and there's, there's no aspiration to do that. So that's also quite different. In a way, it's more insidious because they're replaceable. You can remove one and another one will fill in that spot. And it's, so it's, it's sort of oligarchic control that, that, that's a system and not an individual uh, that makes it so that it's managed to survive this kind of military control of the country for, what, 40 years, right? Um, and why it's been so hard for it to change. Because of this uh, isolation, People are suffering to get contact with the outside world. They cannot open their eye. Their eye has been closed down by the isolation, cut off from every sector. Does she read the newspaper? No. Does she watch television? TV, TV, no. Oh, we just learned. We just learned the religious. You wanted me to bring you Perry Mason. Yes. But it was like $100 for the collection. Yes. Yes, I, I can pay for I can ready to pay for that, no problem. 100 US dollar. Because in here, even I have 100 US dollar, I cannot buy it. One thing good about this America, you have access and you have every right to explore. In Burma, we don't have access. Thinking is not an option and we don't know. When we don't use our brain, you know, it's uh, we have no development. A lot of poor people, they cannot afford to pay medical expenses here. I was so disappointed about their living condition. So I make free of charge to some of them. If the villagers think that they got a fever or, or if they got a diseases, they will never go to a doctor or health provider because they don't have enough money. So they have to rely on the mobile clinic or charity treatment program or quacks. 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 Quacks mean unregistered medical practitioner in our country. They are not trained. They have experience in working with a clinic, like a cleaner or sweeper. They are assisting the doctor and they learn from the doctor. If the patient is suffering from these signs symptoms, uh, what did the doctor do? Even the traditional bath attendants, they hearing from the patients that there's an episiotomy. They don't know what the episiotomy is. They use uh, the knife you use in your kitchen. For an episiotomy? Sure, you know the episiotomy. They try by using some of the razor blade. Sometimes they put on the candlelight to kill some gems. A kitchen knife? A kitchen a knife. A clean one though? No, they uh, wash with the water. Doctors cannot go through the very outreach area. There's a lot of quacks in the local community, rural area, even in the, some outskirts in the Rangoon area, there's a lot of quacks. Uh, the girl is suffering from the coughing, uh, even in rise in temperature, and there are some also yeah. frequently on the uh, different area on the body. Right, so yeah. it's ulcerating. Ulcerating. That's not a good sign. Yeah. What do you think? I think the girl is suffering from TB. TB. The girl is afraid of her procedures because she she felt feeling of very, very pain, severe pain. The medic have already asked them to go and get uh, anti-TB drugs. 
but she has not gone yet. Uh, she don't have no idea how much she is going to pay for any TV treatment. Uh, she also think about the transportation charges. Uh, the outside is so deep. You see? No, I can't see. Yeah. That's a bad ulcer. Yeah. Too bad. I think. Uh, she is now worried that she will not be able to afford for the medical costs. She's not wearing gloves. Yeah. Does she have gloves? Previously, she used gloves, but now uh, she she has recently recovered from stroke. Stroke. She had a stroke. Yeah. Stroke. So by wearing the gloves, feeling a little bit reduced. Uh huh. Feeling feeling is not good. Is she too far gone to save? No. In my opinion, she is still treated well. Uh, the parents are poor, so they cannot take care of her. As the country becomes so much more and more under the military government and control, the military started to interfere with every department, even the health department, and with the doctors. So a lot of doctors left the country. The doctors who are supposed to go and study in like uh, England, some of them decided not to come back. The country cannot um, develop or move um, forward because of the isolation from other countries. In neighboring countries, they may be more advanced and more developed. They may have more um, sophisticated way of living life. Um, but um, people in Burma, they have a very simple life. And um, um, maybe this is one, one reason is because they have an economic hardship. I feel bad for the hard workers to Malaysia or an Asian country, Dubai. Or well, they're going to work as construction workers yeah, and hard labor, right? Of course. So Burma's exporting labor, essentially. I remember that uh, last year of my study, it's the River of Nile by the slaves of Africa. It's telling about the, his slave life, slave life in Rome. I feel the same for my people. I have a heart. I should say, my hands are tied, but... Yeah, I know. Hard labor daily wages equivalent to a dollar or less than a dollar a day. If they want to buy rice, the range will be uh, from 600 jats to over a thousand, which is the money that they can look for for the whole day. People have to struggle for their daily earning or daily life, daily survival. Even the family members, all, although they are not old enough to get into the employment, they are still working to support their family. During this economic hardship time, uh, parents are expecting their children contribution um, to their family income. Financial difficulties put them to stop schooling and um, uh, to put their children at work. How old are you? Fifty. How much? One five. Fifteen? Yeah, fifteen, yeah. Hi, hello. Fourteen. Are you fourteen? Are you fourteen? Yeah, fourteen. And how old is he? He looks very young. He also fourteen. Fourteen? Yeah, he making bamboo medicine. I see. Where did he learn this? There is no standard shy age, you know, uh, for employment. Um, they can employ uh, whenever the child is ready to work. They may be expecting to go to school, but they can't afford it. So this is their reality. For uneducated village people, the children are also a part of the family. They have obligation. They have to work to make that a 
food on the table. They have to provide. It's it's a part a part of responsibility, and you cannot avoid. You have to do that. When you're hungry for a person, you would do anything. Send your kids out to work. Yeah, of course. And you can send not only to work, you can sell them. Sell them to the people who have more money. Or the neighboring country to be workers, yes. But there is no uh, standard age. You can send them in 10 years old, five years, as long as they can move. And it's in different ways. You can send them as a mate. You can send them as a, 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 a wife. You don't know. A lot of uh, teenagers, girls particularly, has been sold in other countries as a slave trade. How can I think and go to bed when I think that my neighbor's daughter, my neighbor's nephew or a nieces will be sold away? Shine labels are everywhere. Even when you go to the tea shop, you see the child is like a waiter or waitress serving you. It is like your son or maybe your granddaughter, grandson. Hey, ask him how old he is. What's he say? 13 years old. He's 13? Does he, do you go to school? No? No school? No school. How far in school did he go? One, one, first grade. That's it? That's it. And ask this boy the same for Hey! When, when yeah. 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 How much? Fourth grade. What the fourth grade? Yeah. Does he work full time here? Does he yeah, always yeah. work? Be my the nigga want lolo. How old is he? Nine years. How much school has he gone to? Bob John Betty Nizi. Two grade. Two grades? Yeah. I think now we will stop. What does he do in the workshop? Can you tell me? Uh Bari Lun. How much are you? How much are you? Uh, car suspension. He works on suspension? Yeah. How's business? Ask him. Uh, you go to school? No school finish. Why? I don't know money. No money for school? Do you like school? Yeah, I like school. How many years did you go to school? One. But you speak good English. I did. How come? Where did you learn English? I sell in painting postcard every day. Uh -huh. Every day. Yes. You guys, I did you speak it. Ah. Yes. You know, uh, it seems the education system, kids are, are not going more than one or two years to school here. That the dropout, dropout from schools is yeah. very high here. In rural areas, the parents cannot provide the education for the children. Because I'm seeing the children are working already at very little age. At uh, eight, nine, they are also in the field. They are working as a maid or a shop or a cafe. So it's terrible. So we try to encourage them. You know, Burma in the 1950s and sort of 60s. It stopped. It's a uh, university in Yemos are, uh, um, I mean, it's higher than Bangkok or nearby countries. We feel very sorry. And I feel regret for the missionaries who work very hard to become, to establish education in Myanmar. That's why we try to encourage our young people to study. How old are you? Ten. 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 You go to school? Mm. No. Why not? I have no money. How much money does school cost? Four, five thousand. And does she want to go to school? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Why? I want to be educated. What does that mean? I want to be educated. I'm, I want to be a doctor. When I was young, people are more equal. They have a good educations provided by the government. 
now that the government education that is provided is almost like, I hate to say that, useless. Burma has a policy that everybody must go to school and everybody must be educated. The law says that. According to statistics as far as I know, only 2% of the total GDP is spent on education and health and social welfare. So this amount of money is nothing. Although the education system is said to be free, now schools depend on private funds. They need funds for so many hidden agendas. And so the education system tends to go down pretty fast. From a paper I recently read, 50% of schooling age kids cannot afford to enroll just school. to primary school. They can't even go to primary school. The parents don't have the funds. So what do they do? Well, uh, most of them are from uh, countryside. So they can go to monastic school. And what is a monastic school like? What do they teach them? Monastic school give um, basic mathematics and, you know, and Burmese language skills, in addition to our religious teaching. Monetary school, they try their best, but the quality is not monitored, and then they do not have good teachers to teach. They are just making do with what they have. Monastery Education School in uh, Tanglian Township near the Sisito village. The children from the villages uh, come. The sons have to walk for half an hour to one hour every day. Just to get here? Uh, yeah, the access of education here is very uh, not choosy, huh? not much. So they have no choice. Are you a teacher? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what, how old are you? 17. 17. <laughs> Burma has quite a long and rich history, and it had some very glorious uh, kingdoms in the past, a uh, thousand years ago, even older than that. There's an ancient ruined city in the middle of Burma called Pagan, and it is the largest ruined city in the world. How big is the whole area? 42 square kilometers. 42 square kilometers, 42, yeah, 42 wow. 42 square kilometers. And there's uh, over 3,000 Buddhists and temples. Historians believe that at some point, Bagan was much more green, lush, thriving with vegetation, and a lot shadier than what it is today. There are suggestions that one of the conquerors of Bagan may have done something to the ecology of the country so that it is no longer a fertile land that it used to be. These date from what? From 11th to 13th century. From 11th to 13th century. The last of that time, the Khan were the capital of Myanmar, as far as the center 
of pure Theravada Buddhism. Burma has uh, like at least three famous kings. The third king name was Anoratha. He was the one who is formed of modern Burma in one sense. To be a king, you have to fight wars and win. He won a lot of wars. And the one thing that he brought from Sri Lanka at that time was the religion. The, the religion that we kind of very proud of at Burma now. Buddhism is deeply rooted in Burmese culture. When you look at the history of Burma, you can see the kings in previous dynasties. They have a high respect to the uh, Buddhist institution. So Buddhism became a part of everyday life for Burmese people. Burmese people are very religious. We believe in reincarnation, before life, after life. If you do cruelty to, say, a dog, next life you become a dog and you in turn will suffer like the dog did. We also believe in karma. If you do evil, the evil will return to you. If you do good deeds, um, good deeds will return to you. On the basic philosophy, I like Buddhism. It's to be true to yourself and life is suffering. Since birth, you suffer, you have greed, you want this, you want that in life. And to reach that goal, you have to invest your energy, everything. But this is only for your one life. And what's after that life? The people, the way we worship, it's very unique. We um, put 100% in that uh, trust to the Buddhism and it shows. What is this thing, this umbrella we call? It is to get shade. For who? Uh, for the statues there. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, you're explaining this to me. <laughs> yeah. If they were born on Saturday, those people may go to the Saturday corner and then they will donate those flowers and umbrellas based on their astrology. I'm just putting the water as my age, you know. And now I'm 34, so I'm going to put 34 cups extra one. So it means I'm going to put 35 cups. Okay. Now I'm, I have done 11, this is 12. People use a very thin gold leaf to stick on the Buddha stupa and uh, Buddha images, and it is the highest respect that they can pay to the Buddha. This gold ribbon cut in small pieces like right. this size, and then we made the package like that, and then beat it for half an hour. After beating, we get this one. And then cut into six pieces. We put it together and then we made the package again. We did for half an hour also. We changed to the bigger size. Beat it for five hours. After this step inside the ladies. They are cutting into square shape of gold leaf. They're making it into packages like that. These are ready for the Buddha. They said if you put in hat, you got a good intelligent, I don't know, brain, they said. This, this is a lot of gold on here, isn't there? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Should we grab it and run? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> How many years of gold is on here, do you think? Oh, these all stupors has been here for hundred, more than 100 years. So it's getting thicker and thicker. Thicker and thicker, and finally it looks like a ball of gold. Shri Pagoda is one of the most famous landmarks in Burma. 
the remains of the Buddha uh, inside the Shirdkom Gorda. So that's why we believe that is a holy place in Burma. The Buddhists are very devout people. They really love their religion. One little thing that is very important for the Burmese people is they really do keep their Sabbath days holy. Chaiktio is a famous small pagoda and it's basically one of the most important Buddhist pilgrimage places in Burma. How dangerous are these things? They, like one a week flips over. No. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, usually 40 people are killed instantly. Yeah. You joking? You can read it me and Mark Times every week one of these turns over, yeah. Should I worry? No, don't worry. I've never seen anybody drive this fast on a mountain pass. So how many go in a week? I was warned specifically, don't get on these buses. What? Walk to the top if you're going to go. You're joking? I'm not joking. And you're telling me now? Yes, I'm telling you now. So aren't these drivers worried about flipping over and dying? No, no we're not worried at all because it's a great honor to drive all these people to the temple every day. And if they die, they're going to their next life will be much more. will be in a more elevated position. So actually, they're looking forward to dying behind the wheel, taking a load of passengers to the bottom of the ravine. People from all around Burma at some point will go to Chaiktio on a pilgrimage and you have to hike up the mountain quite a number of miles, many hours. You tired? <laughs> Tell her it's only 10 kilometers more. <laughs> Did she climb the hill? No, pro no problem. She was tired. I don't know if I can do much more. We're not even there yet. Yep. Yep, but, what? But it's only like 10 minutes away. Oh. I'm in good shape and this is killing me. All right, do you want to, uh, should we continue? What's he saying? He wants to be interviewed. He does? Yeah. 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 What is it? Don't do it. Don't do it. But do you know who's in a journey? The other drop of us do me now. Lana and call me. He wants to invite more visitors. So they will get more job, you know, carrying bags. They would earn more, more money. Oh. What's up, Hoba? You know what you get? Hoba, tell me that I got up. Because the pagoda is very famous and very popular and very powerful, they, they want the visitors to see the pagoda. Oh, I see. So there's been a pagoda here since 500 years BC. Tell me just for this, my own edification. Okay, well this pagoda is uh, supposedly 2,500 years old, and uh, it contains a relic of the Buddha, a Buddha's hair, and the power of the Buddha's hair keeps this rock balanced just like that. That's what the belief is. It's covered in gold leaf. It's real gold leaf. You can see the people applying it right there. And the thing looks like it's balanced. It is balanced. It's amazing. This is really quite a scene, isn't it? It's like a carnival. Mengelaba! 
people come here from all over the country, right? Yes, this is yes. not just Mon and, and no. Burman. This is Mon and Yanko. They came from a lot of places. Where are you from? I'm I'm staying in Yangon, Myanmar. You're in Yangon. Yeah, she lives in Bago Division, Indigo Village. Oh, she lives in Bago. Bago, 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 Anila, as Indigo, so Bago, from as Bago, Anila. Yeah, she's from there. Oh, oh, oh. Jai Myo, you got love, you got it. From Jai Myo City, Jai Myo City. Jai Myo. Mon State. Yeah. Oh, yes. Where do they come from? Peala, Lele. Yangon. Yangon. Oh. Taiji. I'm from Taiji. Taiji City. Amari, Monomari, Lajare. They're cousins. Are they all cousins? This is uh -huh. one big family? Oh. Okay, it's a huge family. Wow. And no. what? You. <laughs> Not huge. No, you. Why? <laughs> Why do they come here? Oh, yes. Why? <laughs> oh, this is a big family. You. You. No. Because they want to pray. They, they want, want me to pray. pray. I will pray. They chant verses from Buddhist teachings. And sometimes it takes like three to five days or five to seven days just chanting to bring peace and to bring calm to the country. Burmese people love peace. That's one thing that I noticed traveling around the country, people are content, sometimes too content. The people's life is very simple. This is because of their bad karmas in the previous life. And in this life, what they have to do in order to get rid of that bad karmas, they have to pray for it, they have to shun every day, they have to have a tolerance and patience whatever they are facing. The Burmese people grew up under a predominantly Buddhist tradition. And this is a population that is easily satisfied. And this is a population that has very little materialistic ambition. Religion is part and parcel of everyday life. And in Buddhism, they stress again and again that one has to be content with life, no matter what. There may be some bad circumstances happening, and we always say that it's fate. So you have to make the best out of it and live with it. And we were encouraged not to complain or protest too much, but try to make it better for yourself and your family. So maybe that's somehow make Burmese people more tolerant of bad circumstances than generally in other parts of the world. Because a lot of people from the West, if they read about Burma, if they see the pictures that has been transmitted, the first thing that came to their mind might be like, why did they let it happen? Colonial rule under English was no picnic, but um, even the staunchest anti-English historians would have to admit that the Japanese occupation is far worse. General Aung San thought he could rely on the Japanese army to help him liberate Burma from the British forces. So he fought alongside the Japanese soldiers. But very quickly, Aung San came to realize that the Japanese promise of independence was an empty one. The Japanese occupation was full of horror stories about beheadings of insurgents, stories of rape, of outright military brutality against civilians. In the end, Aung San joined with the Allied forces in order to liberate Burma from the Japanese. When my father contacted the British, he went to see General Slim who was then leading the 14th Army. And he had said to my father in a, in a rather sort of British jocular sort of way, come on, you've come to us only because we are winning. And my, my father apparently said, well, it wouldn't have been any use to, uh, coming to you if you weren't, would it? So he was very frank about it. But he had, um, the, he always said quite 
openly that there were some things that he admired about the British and there were some things he admired about the Japanese, but he was not prepared to be anybody's slave. My colleagues and I have come to London in response to the invitation of His Majesty's government in order to discuss the constitutional questions of Burma. The demand of our people is complete independence. In January 1948, the Union Jack came down. That was the beginning of Burma's independence. But General Aung San, the national hero, would never get to be part of the new government because on July 19, General Aung San and six of his cabinet members were assassinated. I think it would be a very exceptional two-year-old who could remember what had happened before well, before she was two years old. I don't think I understood that my father had died. Yeah. He was very young. When he died, he was, uh, I think, 32 years and um, five months, something like that. He did an enormous amount in a very short amount of time. Yes, he was a hard worker. Like you? Well, I think he, was, he worked even harder than I do. Things deteriorated quite a bit. So when that happened, there was a need for a caretaker government with somebody who was strong and in charge of the military. So that was when General Ne Win got a chance to experience what it was like to have total and complete control of the country as the chief of the caretaker government. After that two year, he handed back the power, but two years later in 1962, he staged another coup again. Ne Win served as a dictator from 1962 until 1988. And under Nguyen, who made his decisions based on astrology and superstition, the country plummeted downhill. By 1988, most people can barely earn enough money to buy a sack of rice. And in the middle of that, the Nguyen government did something that was rather absurd. The Nguyen government withdrew a couple of currencies from circulations. That, of course, sparked nationwide protest the Burmese government's way of handling that was to order the army to fire into the crowd. There are many people who will tell you that on that day there were Rangoon sewers that were running red with blood. And I would tell you that they were not being poetic when they described that. Nobody knows how many were killed, but estimates place it at 10,000 people. There were massive protests and the the regime under Ne Win finally bowed and agreed to have elections. The regime was so out of touch, they actually lost the election nearly 85 or so percent against them. Everybody was scared that the election would be rigged. It was rigged, but there was so much overwhelming forces against the government that the party led by Aung San Suu Kyi, National League of Democracy, it won by a big landslide. Leading up to 88, Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of General Aung San, came back from England where she had been living. She became the effective leader and the iconic figure of the democracy movement. After the results came in with a landslide against the regime, the military cracked down and nullified the election. Many of her cabinet members have been thrown into prison, and Aung San Suu Kyi herself has spent the last 15 years of the 20 years she was in Burma under house arrest. Uh, you have you put this on? Because yeah, otherwise, no. if you've forgotten, we'll no. have to start all over no, again. No, no, I'm yes. very focused, I think. I was under house arrest altogether three times, and three uh, stints of house arrest, as it were, and each stint was different from the other. The very first time I was under house arrest from 1989 to 1995, I was alone in the house, so I was uh, very much on my own. But at the same time, I had the opportunity, after about nearly three years, to have visits from my family from time to oh, time. You were? I didn't know that. Yes. So you saw your sons? My husband and my sons, all three of them. I was going to ask her if she could have imagined then her situation now. No, I'm glad you didn't. It would be uh, very brutal on her because she had to practically give up 
living with her son when the youngest son when he was only maybe like 12 or 13 yeah a very vulnerable age i mean that must be a horrendous sacrifice Aung San Suu Kyi is just kind of this incredibly resilient and strong woman. I don't know many people who would forgive any establishment that put her under house arrest for nearly two decades of her life, deprived her of her family of seeing her husband pass away. That particular human loss, that connection that was severed because of this house arrest, I know that definitely gets to a lot of Burmese people. That's one of those things that my grandmother, I think, that saddens her as much as her being under house arrest, the fact that she's been disconnected from her family for nearly two decades. In September 2007, the government once again miscalculated the public's reaction and stopped subsidizing fuel production. And when that happened, fuel prices skyrocketed as much as 500%. A lot of the Burmese Buddhist monks felt that it was their duty to protect the Burmese public. So they came out and all they did was simply walk in a single file procession as most Burmese monks often do. I've heard you say that you knew that the, the monk uprising, the Saffron Revolution, would not turn out well. well. How did you know that it wouldn't turn out well? Because I was listening to the news all the time. And uh, I, as I was listening, I could get the vibes that I think anybody who was listening could get, that it was not, there was, there was no move on the side of the authorities to come to any, any kind of understanding, to, to come to any kind of negotiated settlement. The government troops went ahead and beat a lot of the monks and throw them into prison. Now, any violence against a monk is considered to be really the ultimate sin. And when news of monk beatings got around, uh, the Burmese really rose up. The outraged public joined the monks' protests, and that essentially turned into a nationwide uprising that was led by the monks. The government ordered the army to fire on the unarmed protesting Buddhist monks, and a lot of the Buddhist monks died. It could be in the thousands, but the official numbers was less than a hundred. The Saffron Revolution then was crushed with military might, with guns, with bullets. Today, if you walk around downtown Rangoon, you might still see monks walking in procession, saying Buddhist prayers, doing exactly what they have been doing for centuries. But what you don't know is that many of these monks have endured incredible brutality at the hands of the Burmese militaries and the military intelligence. There are tourists who go to Burma and they could travel around for weeks and come back and think they've seen the most happy-go-lucky country they've ever seen. However, aside from the glorious Buddhist temples and the Buddhist festivities and all that, underneath that there is a dark Burmese history a history of very brutal despotic kings that would sacrifice virgins at the cornerstones of their new palaces, uh, who would execute people and even monks almost arbitrarily for defying them. The vast majority of people are afraid of government. It's been part of their heritage for a thousand years. Government wasn't designed to solve problems for local people. It was designed to protect them from foreigners and from deviant ethnic groups. Uh, those people who seize power and govern through the centuries are not people out to do good for the common person. A lot of these generals are often from very poor families and the only way that they can improve their quality of life and you cannot blame them for wanting to do that is to get into the military because it's not like they're gonna get into a good school and work hard and work their way up. 
they can't do that because schools are bad. And so what happens is that the military is just packed with people who are completely uneducated. And so they're very susceptible to brainwashing and blind obedience, essentially. We're not looking just at individuals who are greedy. We're looking at people who honestly feel they're doing good, that they are the right kind of people to govern because that's the way their mothers and fathers taught them. They believe, I think, uh, that they are single-handedly keeping together this country that has been very difficult to keep together for all the centuries. I think they think that they're misunderstood, that they're working extremely hard for this country and that no one really appreciates what they're doing. I also think that, you know, clearly they're, they're involved in creating a kleptocracy and that they've gotten a little distracted from that you know, quote-unquote, noble task that they were engaged in, and now they're more involved, perhaps, in, in uh, stripping the country of its resources. And this is the way I think, I think, I mean, who knows what they think. Um, but it, fundamentally, ultimately, it's a mystery as to how they think. You know, nobody talks to them, they don't get information from their own people, let alone from the outside world, in any way that's coherent. Uh, but my guess is they think that they're doing the best job that they can possibly do and that they work incredibly hard at it. They are those who are of the opinion that without a military government there can be no stability in Burma. But I do not think I agree with that because I think real stability can only come if the government of a, of a country and the people of the country can work in unity and they have confidence in each other. A, a, a firm, strong, authoritarian hand cannot create unity. It can only give the appearance of unity. On May 2, 2008, Cyclone Nargis made landfall in the Delta region of Burma. It was a storm that charged in at 105 miles per hour speed. That's how hell broke loose in Burma. After Nargis hit and took the worst possible route through Burma, and then hit the capital, Yangon, head on without even losing energy, the cyclone winds were so violent that in villages, the thatch houses were just being blown away and parents, in many cases, actually tied their kids to trees so the kids wouldn't blow away. The tragic thing is, in much of this area, then the tidal surge came in, a 20-foot-high wall of water. The estimated death toll from Nargis is upward of 130,000 people. The Burmese government's response was to downplay it, to pretend that they were in full control of the rescue and recovery process and the cleanup efforts. Forty-five minutes away from Rangoon in Bangkok airport, there were medical supplies, medical professionals. They were all sitting idle, waiting to get into the country because the Burmese military regime wouldn't grant them permission to come into the country. The Burmese authorities would not let these ships come in and unload. They would not let the supplies be brought in by helicopter or any other means. But on the ground, as every hour passes, things grew more desperate. I was in these devastated areas. Uh, they desperately needed all the help they could get. 
and they certainly weren't getting it from the Burmese regime. There were hundreds of thousands of orphaned kids. And these kids, they were just swept away by the tidal surge that went through the Delta and deposited miles away. But young kids don't even know the name of their own village. They don't even know the proper names of their own parents because they call their parents mom and pop. We need change in Burma. Burma is a rich country because of its natural resources, but our most important resource is a human resource, and that has been neglected. Our people do not have adequate education, they do not have adequate health care. We want to build up a society of people who are allowed to care for themselves, who are allowed to shape their own destiny. I really worry and concern about the people in Burma, how they are going to live, how they are going to raise their children, how they are going to make a plan for their future generations to live in Burma. Forget for the moment about the kind of government that they have, which is a lousy government from most anybody's point of view. Some see them as just uh, persisting in holding their own power. From my vantage point, there is a slow slippage of power as young people, particularly the grandchildren of the current group, are hanging on to Western ways. Those Western ways are very dangerous from the vantage point of their grandparents. But from their vantage points, they want the same access that Indian kids and Chinese kids and Thai kids have to the rest of the world. And uh, that's happening. I just want this country to prosper. It used to be like the second richest country in Asia. Now it just dropped to the bottom. I don't want to let it happen, you know. You care about this country. Of course I do. Yeah. My hope is that, you know, all the people in Burma start thinking about what they want, what they really want, and try to get it. Right now, all they know is like, oh, San Suu Kyi is the only hope. But, you know, we have to find another way as well. Nobody dares to talk about the politics before the public in Myanmar. It is very sensitive and it's really hard for Myanmar youth to discuss about politics. And I have never been asked such kind of question. Does that make you nervous? Yeah, it make me nervous. In Myanmar, we rarely speak out our feelings, even with my parents, with our friends. This is my first time I speak up my feelings, my perspective, my personal view. And how does it feel? I think feel weird <laughs> and strange and excited. <laughs> Great feeling, but Good. weird. <laughs> because it's the first time. <laughs> really? In your whole life? Yes, yeah, in my whole you life. You can't talk to friends? Yes, it's a memory way, it's a memory culture. My generation, um, I think we are quite conservative. The new generation is totally different. Something that we cannot understand. They are more frank, open, friendly, and they may have more chances. For well, those kids who are in the regular classes, children of the people who are well-to-do, the only thing that they are thinking now is to get a good education, get out of the country. Anywhere is good, except Burma. Anywhere from Burma, which is a sad thing because nobody is willing to stay back home to take care of what is needed to be done. Yeah, what's the future for Burma? That's a good question. Burma can go one of several ways. In the best case scenario, Burma would slowly but surely build up a thriving democracy and turn into a decent country. And in the worst case scenario, Burma can descend into a hell like Cambodia did. Young people now are much more self-aware than were there 
older brothers and sisters 50 years ago. What I see when I go back is a country building on very old foundations. And there's a power in that that is missing in Thailand and Malaysia and Vietnam. And it's a power that 50 years hence is going to be a hell of a lot more demonstrable than what those countries have. Preserving the tradition and cultures is a good thing. These are very important to see the rear picture of Burma. But the sustainability of those cultures and traditions and the uniqueness without the economic resources, do you think that they can sustain them? What I realize now is that there is a whole generation of young Burmese people who have never tasted the fruit of democracy. What it means to speak your mind, what it means to think, read, write what you feel like saying or writing or doing. There is a whole generation of Burmese people who cannot understand the idea of speaking their mind freely without thinking about consequences. This is like kind of hard for me to say that without feeling sad because Burma is not like that. Burma is not like the way that the world has seen. We are a proud country and we can be independent and we are not begging for charity. We are asking for some help so that we will be giving a fair chance to stand on our own feet and be a proud member of the world's community. I have hope, but at the same time, I am a realist. Things will not happen on its own. It has been ongoing. It has been rotting for the last 40 years. Sometimes I play alternative history games, just to imagine what Burma might be like if it is not living under a military regime. And I think about the fact that there are lots of young people who have stories they cannot tell because of the political situation that they live under. I would love to hear those stories. I would love to hear the stories about falling in love for the very first time. I'd love to hear the stories about discovering medieval Burmese heroes for the first time. And tell Burmese history in the way that it is supposed to be told. Not the way the state-sponsored education system tells you you should learn. Not the way that the school textbooks tells you how history took place. And I would love to see Burma one day become that kind of country the kind of country where you can speak, read, write poetry, the way your heart tells you to do it. Do you think of yourself as a politician? Yes, of course I'm a politician. It strikes me that you've gone beyond that. No, I think Politicians who think that they've gone beyond being politicians are very dangerous.
Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished members of the Nobel Committee, dear friends. When I joined the democracy movement in Burma, it never occurred to me that I might ever be the recipient of any prize or honor. The prize we were working for was a free, secure, and just society where our people might be able to realize their full potential. When the Nobel Committee chose to honor me, the road I had chosen of my own free will became a less lonely path to follow. For this, I thank the committee, the people of Norway, and peoples all over the world whose support has strengthened my faith in the common quest for peace. Thank you.